Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's uh, April 12th and it's time for another Deep Space update. Uh, all the news that, uh, well, basically runs into my head. It's been, uh, well, you know, just over a week and we'll start with the launches. First of all, April 1st, we had the Transporter 4 launch from SpaceX on a Falcon 9 out of Florida into sun-synchronous orbit, carrying 40 spacecraft from a whole bunch of different customers. The biggest payload was the NMAP satellite, which was almost a ton. At the other end of the scale, there was like a dozen space bee swarm, you know, tiny micro uh, satellites. And, you know, a bunch of like Hawkeye 360, um, you know, satellites, which uh, you know, they basically do signals mapping around the world for commercial organizations. Yeah, I think it was like a dozen countries, which is kind of uh, cool. Now, uh, next, April 2nd, there was uh, Electron from Rocket Lab without mission a beat. This was the fourth and final dedicated launch for Black Sky, carrying two of their imaging satellites to low Earth orbit. April 6th, China launches a Long March 4C carrying a Gaofen 303 uh, satellite into sun synchronous orbit. This is a high resolution Earth imaging platform which is operated by civilian programs for, you know, um, land management and urban development and everything else. April 7th, a Soyuz launch from Placetsk carrying the Lotus S1 number 5 also known as Cosmos 2554. That is a military electronic intelligence satellite. It was in a 900 kilometer orbit, um, you know, 67 degrees. So uh, as I understand it in this low orbit, it's not looking at communications intelligence. It's primarily trying to find and characterize things like beacons and radar. So, uh, you know, that's an important thing if you say planning to invade somewhere. Uh, April 8th. This is a big one. This is probably the most important launch this week. Axiom 1, AX1, the Endeavour launches on top of a Falcon 9 carrying four passengers, four private astronauts. Michael Alegria Lopez, Larry Connor, Ethan Stibbe, and Mark Pathy, right? These are, okay, so obviously uh, the commander, Michael Lopez, is like, he's an astronaut with a lot of experience. But uh, he's the pilot, he's part of Axiom, so he is basically the driver for this mission. The other three are the paying passengers, each paying $55 million each for a flight to space, docking with the space station, and hanging out and doing their private astronaut stuff, which in the well, they say includes experiments, but I'm sure it includes lots of playing with your food in space and looking out the window. But yeah, this is a big deal because it's the first fully commercial mission, a uh, crew mission, to the International Space Station. Uh, it's also interesting, I think this is the first uh, Dragon to dock to Harmony, uh, the Zenith port of Harmony. Normally, the, uh, normally they've come in and they dock through the front port uh, for the crew missions. This, they've actually circled all the way to the top and docked at the top. I think they're the first one to do that, although there's cargo dragons which have done, uh, done this. Uh, yeah, okay, so those are the launches. What else has been going on? Well. Artemis 1 has been doing its dress rehearsal and it has been problematic. So there were delays due to weather. Uh, the very first day they had that they got it going, they had to scrub because fans in the ground support equipment were not operating and that meant that they couldn't blow out like uh, combustible gases and make sure that those weren't building up. There was a second attempt which got cut short partway through because they had problems with fueling procedures due to valves, but not valves on SLS, or not valves on the booster stage, right? And, and uh, this was the upper inter, inter, uh, inter, interim, that's right, interim cryogenic propulsion stage, ICPS. And that is basically a Delta IV upper stage in almost every single way. So yeah, this isn't Boeing's fault, although technically they did design that because it's part of the Delta IV. Um, so the plan now is to resume the dress, wet dress rehearsal with mi minimal changes. They're going to load up the first stage with its propellant, but the second stage they're going to do a minimal fuel load just to make sure that the fuel flows and everything work. They'll then have to roll the whole thing back to the vehicle assembly building, which was always planned, and then perform the necessary valve replacements and fixes before they can go forwards. Uh, the other really big news, the biggest 
contract ever in space launch history. The biggest launch deal, Amazon's Kuiper uh, communications network signed on with like 80 launches from three different providers. ULA, Blue Origin, and Ariane Space are gonna launch something like 3,300 satellites for the Kuiper uh, communications network. So there's gonna be 38 launches from ULA using their Vulcan launcher, and that is on top of the nine Atlas V that they've already signed on for. There's gonna be 18 launches on Ariane 6, and 12 on New Glenn with an option for like 15 more at this point. Now, none of these launch vehicles is active at this time. So they're obviously expecting this to be able to you know, deliver what they need. As of right now, Amazon's launch license requires that they have 50% of their satellites in orbit by 2026. So they have their work cut out for them. Also, ABL Space will launch a couple of demo satellites on their first launch. That's worth including those. As a result of this, Vulcan looks like it has a very healthy launch manifest. Uh, ULA announced that they have ordered 116 RL-10 engines. They need two of those for the upper stage on Vulcan. So that'll cover all their Kuiper launches and a lot of other launches that they already have signed on for. On the other side of the communications uh, space, let's say, Starlink lost its uh, radio license in France after, well, basically legal activists decided to challenge it and it was noted that there was no public comment period before SpaceX could give them their license for the Spectrum. And the reasoning was, of course, that there were other satellite operators already operating. Why do you need another public comment? Well, now they've been forced to do it. There's a chance they'll get it back. So if you're in France and you want to say something for or against Starlink, I believe there's a public comment process going on now until like May 9th. Yeah, have your say and then maybe the license will get reissued or maybe France will do something else because, you know, France. Uh, European Space Agency also, uh, it's, it's not a big announcement, but they announced that they're going to launch uh, Sentinel-1C on a Vega rocket. Now, that's not necessarily a big deal. They previously launched their satellites on Vegas. But right now, it's uh, really an interesting vote of confidence because Vega, of course, the Avum upper stage relies on rocket engines that are built in Ukraine. So they are clearly hoping or assuming that at some point this situation will be resolved sufficiently that Vega can continue either with Ukrainian engines or with another source of engine at this point. Uh, as a sort of side thing, you know, that again, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is also causing changes to other satellite operators' plans because there's a lot, satellites are very high value things that they want to spend the least amount of time in the sea. So, so, well, basically they tend to move satellites on planes a lot. And given that the Antonov fleet has uh, not only suffered some losses, but the ones that aren't lost are still sort of stuck in Ukraine at this point, uh, there's scheduling issues regarding transport on the aircraft and that will change a bunch, a bunch of satellite operators' plans. Uh, yeah, what else? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember Spin Launch? Oh yes, Spin Launch, the guys that spin their thing around in a vacuum chamber and then let it go and are planning, they really hope that they will be able to launch a first stage this way at about two and a half kilometers per second and then get it into orbit using rocket engines. So NASA has signed on to get a couple of demonstration, at least one demonstration launches. This is part of their uh, orbit flight opportunities program. And look, this isn't necessarily that much of a vote of confidence by NASA. NASA really sees the flight operations program, uh, opportunities program, as a way to like give money to people developing launch vehicles and other interesting technologies to make sure that there's some support out there, some basic market, some seed that can help drive a little bit of private investment. Yeah, Spin Launch, um, you know, they haven't heard much since their previous launch. Obviously, every time we talk about Spin Launch, everyone's like, oh, but... This guy on the YouTube, he went and completely busted the whole thing. And frankly, uh, the two main things that I heard from that were vastly wrong. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think that Spin Launch necessarily have a market there. I think the pro I think Spin Launch, while they might be able to launch something at two and a half kilometers per second, their own design has a launch vehicle which is almost the same mass as an electron rocket and it puts about the same mass into space. So I don't see the advantage given that they have, they're basically replacing sh uh, fuel with heat shielding. Anyway, 
that spin launch. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> and now I notice in my notes, Python space or Monty Python space. Okay. Uh, yeah, they have been the talk of Twitter for the last, uh, wow. Yeah, they've been basically talked about a lot the last few days, mostly for the wrong reasons. Uh, they included a test of their uh, your vehicle with a lot of fancy drone footage, hardware setup, a rocket engine firing, but also included footage of the team in their dugout running away, run away, yes, from the yeah, basically the giant cloud of dust that was being generated by their rocket engine. So some people were saying, oh, look at that orange cloud. They're using hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. That is poisonous. And they responded by saying, no, we're actually using furfural alcohol and uh, nitric acid, which I'm going to point out nitric acid isn't as toxic as hydrazine. It is, however, still highly corrosive and uh, yeah, also very hot. I, I wouldn't want to be near that. You know, the engine test video does show a lot more fire than thrust. But you know what? Like, here's the thing. I see these guys and I see the photos they've taken and it looks like they're enjoying themselves. It looks like a hobby. It looks like they're trying to build some fantastic contraption for amateur rocketry or for an art camp at Burning Man. And more power to them. I just hope they don't get hurt. I wouldn't invest in them, but uh, look, if they do this and they have fun, great. Uh, just be careful. Lockheed uh, have also, they, Lockheed have published an open source plan for um, what's called a mission augmentation port. It's basically an open source docking standard for satellites. Lockheed are clearly wanting to promote future in-orbit servicing for all satellites. And so they've announced a standard. They've documented out that for you if you want to build it and attach it to your spacecraft. And then uh, maybe you too can be... Uh, you know, be intimate with Lockheed in orbit. Uh, Rocket Lab have announced that the next flight uh, of their Electron is going to be recovered, or that's the plan. It's, they're aiming to recover it under the helicopter. So Rocket Lab, the stages come down underneath a parachute, and as they're then descending, they're going to fly in with a helicopter, a modified Sikorsky S-92, and have a cable hanging down and try to hook this and bring it back without it ever touching the evil ocean, which is obviously not very good to rockets. Uh, that'll be quite fantastic to watch. Uh, it should happen later this month and it should be, yeah, watch out for it. Um, US Space Command made an interesting scientific announcement. So they, they basically confirmed that a 2014 meteor observed over Papua New Guinea was actually an interstellar object. So there were some astronomers at Harvard that had authored a paper about this meteor and using the public data that was available, they said there was like a 99.999% chance of this being interstellar. They couldn't confirm it. But then Space Force scientists, they were able to follow up on the event using classified data available to Space Force and not publicly. And they confirmed this meteor had interstellar origin. And this predates the discovery of Oumuamua by three years. So again, it's very cool. And now since it exploded over the ocean, there is some talk that wouldn't it be amazing to actually try to find fragments of this in the ocean? I, I'm going to say that seems like a tall order, but it would be pretty amazing to find that. Uh, what else? Uh, Elon Musk. Yes, e the Elon show never stops, right? Uh, he put, a, like, this isn't really space, but it's space related because he put all this money into Twitter. Uh, there was some talk of then getting on the board, but then he changed his paperwork to become an activist investor, and now he's the biggest shareholder. Uh, yeah. I don't know, that. I hope that doesn't change the dynamics too much. Um, but yeah, the real space news, I guess, God, there's, there's not much that I can think of off the top of my head, but I guess we had to talk about the FAA delaying the environmental review at Boca Chica again, but more concretely this week, or in the last week, the US Army Corps of Engineers closed SpaceX's permit application for an expansion of the Boca Chica facility because it had been sitting around for months uh, and they had requested data from SpaceX and SpaceX hadn't delivered it. So as of right now, the, the permit application has been closed. No changes will be made. SpaceX is free to reopen it once they provide the information necessary. They wanna, 
basically expand out and add extra launch pads, extra launch mounts. But maybe that doesn't work anymore since uh, the environmental review is taking so long and they will have to look over at uh, the Kennedy Space Center instead. Yeah, you know, it, it is interesting, this dynamic, because, of course, Texas wants this there, but Texas don't actually control this land because it's coastal wetlands. West Wetlands, I believe, are controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers because they're, it's not just that they're environmentally sensitive and whatever. It's that wetlands are very important to flood control, and there's been so many stories in the past of, like, places that just pave over, reclaim land, and then have massive flooding because they didn't quite understand the dynamics. So... That's why the Army Corps of Engineers, I believe, is in charge of this. Okay, so that is all the news that I've got off here. I'm sure there's stuff I've missed because space moves very, very quickly. Or at least you move very, very quickly in orbit. Next time I do this, I'm sure uh, Axiom will be back on Earth and we'll be getting ready for the next crew launch. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.